change. There we go. It might take a little bit just to get it going. So the three things I'm going to cover today are why you should have a management plan, why is the management plan important, what is a management plan, and then what you might find in a management plan. And uh, when we had the very first session, someone posed the question of whether we would see a management, an MFL management plan. We did talk about the Manage Forest Law or MFL in our first session. And although I don't have a specific sample of a management plan in here, this entire talk is based off of an MFL plan. And I would say that, that the MFL plan is probably the Cadillac of management plans in Wisconsin. So probably the most in-depth management plan that you'll see. So that's what I used for this presentation, but that does not mean that every management plan has to be that in-depth. And we'll talk a little bit about that in just a little minute here. But there we go. You'll have to excuse me. There's some animation in here, and I don't usually like using that, so I'm going to have to bring some of this up a bit slower. So. Uh, in my mind, if you were to ask me, and I'll come out and say at the very beginning, my bias is that I think that every woodland owner should have a written management plan for their property. Uh, that would be, and to actually follow that written management plan. However, I recognize that that's probably not realistic for most people. And so I will say that to me, if you even have a management plan in your head or you have a few notes jotted down so that your thoughts are there recorded for the, whoever inherits your land or whoever buys your land next has an idea of where you were going with your property, even that is a great place to start and uh, to get your hands into the quote management planning process, at least to have some thoughts in your head is a great place to start. And the reason for that is that your forest is part of a larger system. And all these five points you see on the screen in front of you, ecologically healthy forests, uh, high quality timber products, is part of that system. So when you make a decision on your property, whether to be cut firewood or to tap for maple syrup or to perform a timber harvest, it affects all the rest of these that you see up on the screen in some way or another. So to understand that your forest is part of that system is uh, is part of the management plan. A couple of other reasons why f management planning is important is you have invested a healthy sum of money into purchasing your property, or if you inherited it, there is someone invested a healthy amount of money into purchasing that property. So not only have you invested money, but those trees that are standing on your forest are worth a lot of money. Uh, so you don't want to make a decision that could impact you financially. Uh, it also, uh, forests also last for many generations. And so although you may own the property and never have a timber harvest on your property, what you do can impact the timber harvest that might be part of a future generation's timber harvest. Uh, as I mentioned before, coordination of multiple uses requires planning. So again, if you're cutting firewood, you might be impacting other things that you were hoping for on that property. And the last point of all players being on the same page, there's two points to this. One would just be your family, your partner that you own the property with, or your kids. Uh, it's good to communicate with them somehow what your hopes and dreams are for that property and what you'd like to see on that property. So a plan is a good way to do that. Uh, at this, on the same page, uh, the, it's also important when it comes to having a timber harvest for all the players involved to understand what is happening in that forest or what you want to happen in that forest. You own this property, it's yours, so you don't want somebody to be making a decision when it comes to a timber harvest that you don't approve of. So to have a plan written out, uh, and again, whether it's an official full-blown MFL plan or some points that you have on a page, if you're sharing that with a forester and if you're sharing that with a logger, you've got a clear plan of communication. So you have everybody understanding what might be happening there. So some important reasons why management planning should be taken care of on your property. Um, I, I will, I do use the word right in this presentation quite a bit. And I, I use, that, use that word loosely. 
again, it could be in your head, but just for the fat ease of this presentation, I'm probably just going to use the word to write a management plan. So what's actually, oops, I missed a slide here. Um, if it's not uncommon to run into people who uh, don't want to perform or don't want to have a timber harvest on their property. And so they may decide that they're not going to do any management. So their management plan is no management. That's still a management decision to not manage is um, is to do no management is to, is to actually manage. I know that sounds kind of backwards, but um, and I, I guess another thing is it's not we're not talking just about timber harvest. We could be talking about putting in a trail on your property. Uh, we could be talking about putting a birdhouse up. That's still doing some kind of management on your property. So uh, the first point I want to make is, as far as no management is the first point on here in the unhealthy forest and overcrowded. Uh, when trees are in the forest, they are competing for light, they're competing for nutrients, and they're competing for water. And if you have a stand that is overcrowded, which is likely to happen if you're not doing harvesting on your property, you, those trees are going to be stressed because they're competing for those nutrients. Let's say you have your property, your neighbor has their property, they've been harvesting their trees, so their trees are less stressed than yours. When it comes to an insect or a disease coming onto that property, uh, that insect or disease is likely to choose your woods over the healthy stand because the stressed trees are easier to get at, easier to attack, easier to uh, take over. So again, if you're choosing no management, understand what the possible implications of that are. That said, I think our bigger concern, or Forrester's bigger, con bigger concern, is actually mismanagement. And that is the situation that you see in the picture on the left of the screen here. And I'm going to get my little spotlight tool here. So this piece of property was logged, and you see this tree was cut here. We, not, we don't know why that tree was decided that, that tree was cut. Likely, if you see, it's a bigger stump, so it was probably worth more. But if you look what they left behind in this tree right here, it goes up and it forks and it kind of goes right here, you're leaving really poor, low-quality trees um, that either aren't going to last as long, they're not going to be worth as much in timber value, uh, they might not produce as much um, food for wildlife because they're working more on trying to make themselves a stronger tree than producing seed. So there's any number of reasons that, that uh, mismanagement actually can damage a forest more than not doing any management at all. So uh, the best way to think of a management plan is a map for your forest, where you want to go with your forest. It's a, it's a loosely, again, a document of your plans for your woodlands. And I just wanted to make a point of this word sustainable forestry. We use it a lot in Wisconsin, and those of you that aren't as familiar with um, forest certification, uh, forest certification is a process that Wisconsin, both state lands and any land that is enrolled in the Managed Forest Law Program, uh, they are certified by two outside programs. One is called FSC and the other is called Tree Farm. And those ensure that those, that those two programs ensure that the forests under those programs are managed in a sustainable fashion, uh, which is a pretty good way of saying that your forest is going to be managed for future generations and it's going to be managed to be a healthy forest. There are some benefits to going through the process of management planning, and one is helping you to learn about your woodlands, so getting out there, um, learning what's on your woods, learning what kind of trees are there, learning what kind of natural features are out there. It's a great way to just get out in your woods and see what's out there. Uh, it's a process that will allow you to think about your short-term goals and your long-term goals. Uh, for example, if you wanted to, let me try to think of an example here. Um, if you want, if you have a pine plantation on your property right now, but you're really interested in a little bit more diversity on your property, then that would probably be a long-term goal because in order to convert that forest to a northern hardwoods forest, uh, it's going to take many, many years to get to that process. Or it could be short-term that you, um, 
are hoping to make a little bit of money next spring and so you want to, as the picture shows in the bottom here, tap some trees and, and make some maple syrup and sell the maple syrup. Management plan, pro the process will also help, ben uh, help you identify what financial benefits are there for managing the land. Okay, um, forest management, there's several things that uh, a forester will look at in order to make some decisions on your property and we'll actually look at what a forester is, is accounting for in your forest in the inventory in a minute here. Uh, but essentially they're going to be using appropriate silvicultural systems and I'm actually going to pop up a little definition here on the bottom again for you that talks about what silviculture is and it's the art and science of managing a forest and they're essentially the tools that we have in our pocket to help get a forest to where we want it to be. So that might be a thinning of a forest, it might be a clear cut of a forest, it might be a single tree selection and those are all um, some big vocabulary words, there's even more that I'm trying not to use right now and if you are interested in learning a little bit more about silviculture there are some good publications on that website that can point out uh, there's some uh, little glossaries on there as well, so you can look up what some of those, excuse me, words mean. But a forester is going to look at your property and depending on what's on your property, determine what you can do with your property. So looking at the site quality and the potential. For example, um, a forester is going to try and get you what might grow best there. The, an example of this is uh, if you have sandy soils, you're probably not going to be able to grow white oak and a forester will help you understand that and understand why. Um, a lot of people love black walnut but growing black walnut north of Stevens Point is mm, kind of a, a, a test on the on black walnut and you probably won't get the best quality of black walnut. Um, so we're trying to help determine what the land will nurture the best on that property. We'll also look at the current condition of the forest um, are they healthy trees? Are they not healthy trees? Do they need to be thinned? Are they are they have in too much competition? Um, yeah, a forester should also be working with you to determine what your goals and your objectives are for your property, and then they're going to be suggesting some uh, su some management practices for your property. They're probably not going to suggest something that's going to cost you a fortune, but you will see little financial benefit in the future. So the steps to a management plan, I'm actually going to add one to the beginning of that and the first one there says find a forester you trust. But before you find a forester, I would highly suggest you uh, go out on your land, walk around, um, if, you can, if you have a map of your property from the sale of it or if you have a plat book or whatever or just a blank piece of paper, start mapping some stuff out to see what's out there. Uh, where are your favorite trees? Where's your favorite hunting spot? Where is your deer stand? Where do you like to take your ATV? Where do you like to take your mountain bike? Where have you seen the best birds? And kind of map that out because that'll help you understand what your goals are for your property. Then find a forester and um, we did talk about finding a forester in that first session but uh, if you're going out and looking for a forester and you're on the phone with them and they say I'm going to charge you this much money and I'll be it on your property in April and that's it and they hang up, probably not a great forester to go with because you want them to help you with number two. So if a forester is on the phone with you and he or she is asking you uh, how you use your property, what you're hoping to get out of your property, that's probably a forester who's going to incorporate your goals and objectives. Uh, since you aren't foresters, uh, there might be some things that you can come that you can get from your property that you don't know about and once a forester walks your land he can tell you what else you have out there and maybe see if there's some other goals and objectives that you'd like to add to the list that you already have developed. Then a forester is going to walk your property and do a very detailed inventory of it and like I mentioned we'll talk about that inventory in a little bit and then based on the based on your goals and objectives and based on what you have in your forest, he's going to he or she is going to determine the management activities and then put everything into a written plan for you. So, 
let's get into the details of those steps. Uh, again, this was presented in the assistance presentation. If you were not around for that one, it, that one is actually recorded and it is online, so you're welcome to go to that woodlandinfo.org uh, site and then click on Learn About Your Land Sessions to go to the internet website. And if you click on the assistance presentation, it'll pop up and you can watch that. And in that presentation, we talked about what to look for in a forester. Just really quickly as a reminder that there are three types of foresters. There are DNR private lands foresters who work for the Department of Natural Resources. There are consulting foresters. And then there are industrial foresters. So. Some things to think about before you talk to a forester. Some questions for you. And you can write these, you can even write them down now and, and answer these for yourself either now or when we get off the, off the webinar tonight. How do you use your woodlands? Are you out there daily? Are you out there weekly? Are you out there just in the summer? Uh, is, are your, is, your, is the summer part of the forest and what you see in the forest in the summer the most important part to you? Uh, what do you want to get from your woodlands? So perhaps, like in this picture here, you want to hunt turkey on your property, but you don't have the habitat for that right now. So in the future, you'd like to get turkey on your property. So how do you use it now, and how would you like to use it in the future? Uh, some very basic example potential areas of interest, and we've talked about these a number of times, but do you need some income off of your property? Uh, do you, are you interested in wildlife habitat, whether that's for hunting or just observation of wildlife? Do you play on your property? Again, going back to the example of the, uh, the plantation, are you interested in having a little bit more diversity on that property? Once you have that, those general areas of interest lined out, uh, there's some more specific questions that you should ask yourself. And that's to help the forester put a bit more of a timeline to it or to be a bit more specific because wildlife is a great goal to have, but what kind of wildlife? Because that's going to determine what kind of harvest you have on your property or what kind of trees to put on your property or if you have an open field, what you might plant. Uh, if, for example, you have a child that's about to go into college in a few years and you might need some money for them to go to college, Maybe that's a good thing to plan for so that you could do a timber harvest right before they go to college. Or if you're about to retire, maybe you'd like a little bit more income when you retire. Um, some other things we haven't talked about as much, maybe you're interested in um, producing firewood off your property. Maybe you're interested in doing non-timber forest products such as maple syruping or cutting boughs or harvesting mushrooms. Uh, so all those things, be a little bit more specific about what types of firewood you'd like, uh, what kind of recreation you're going to be using it for, what types of, what, what seasons you're going to be using that, the, the recreation. That'll help, again, be more specific in that plan. So a forester is going to, once they've chatted with you a little bit, will go out into your forest and collect some very specific information and they'll call that they'll call that cruising your property and some of the data that's collected you see here uh, what types of trees are out there how big how how round and how tall they are how well they're growing uh, a site index is essentially a measure of how well those trees are growing so they'll take the age of a tree they'll see how tall it is and they'll see whether that tree is the best tree for that property it also will show if there's something going on that is causing them to not grow as well as they could be. And they'll also be looking at stand density and volume, which will help them determine if it's time to do a timber harvest. A couple of pictures for you here. One thing you'll hear foresters talk about quite a bit is DBH, which stands for diameter at breast height, which is four and a half feet from the ground, as you see in this picture on the left here. And that's generally because we have some swell here towards the bottom, so we want to pick something that's normal diameter. And in the picture here, it looks like he's not, in fact, measuring diameter since he's not going around the tree. However, that tool that he has in his hand is called a Biltmore stick, and it has a scale on it. And if he holds it, if you look over here, 25 inches 
uh, from his eye and he lines it up on the left side of the tree and then he looks over to the right side and that will tell him what the diameter of that tree is. It's way faster than wrapping your arms around every tree and uh, foresters get really good at actually even probably estimating without using a stick, but you'll see most of them carrying a stick around. There are uh, diameter tapes that we do use as well. Um, so anyway, that's just a little term that you might see or hear people use and see people doing out in the woods when a forester comes out there. Some other tools. There's that handy dandy Biltmore stick again, right here. And there are other pieces of uh, other tools as part of that Biltmore stick. One is it has, uh, it can measure height, it generally based on how many logs. So that has lines on it that says this is how, how many eight foot logs are within that one tree. Um, he looks pretty excited to be doing that. So <laughs> I think foresters in general are pretty happy people because they get to hang out in the woods most of the time. Uh, here you'll see an electronic um, data collector. So rather than having tallying sheets, which I think a lot of foresters still use the tally sheets, the tally sheets you can see actually over here in this left picture. Um, but here they're actually entering the data, the tree species, how tall they are, what their diameter is, so on and so forth. Um, uh, they enter it right into the machine and it does all the calculations for them. Also, a forester will probably have a uh, either an aerial photo and or uh, a map of your property. And that will help, by looking at this picture, they can see where there's potentially different forest stands. And we'll talk about forest stands in a few slides. But they want to see everything that's on your property. So if your property is one big stand, aspen stand, they're probably only going to need to see part of it. But if you have aspen in one area, and you have a plantation in another, and you have northern hardwoods in another, they're going to collect data about each of those different locations and manage each of those different locations differently. And the very bottom here, uh, Bill Show actually has a slide of this in the first presentation, but this is an increment borer. And uh, I'm actually entering that into a tree, and I'm taking a core of a tree going to the heart of the tree. And then I can pull that core out and look at the rings on the tree. And I can count how old the tree is, but I can also see how fast or slow that tree is growing. So if the rings on the outer edge of that tree are really close together and narrow, it's probably time to thin because it's not getting enough nutrients to grow as much as it could. And uh, some people have asked whether this hurts the tree. It, technically, yes, it does, but the, usually the trees heal over from those wounds, and a forester is not going to pick your highest quality uh, tree to be drilling a hole into. They're probably going to be picking something that isn't worth as much money. So it, it's not truly hurting the tree uh, in the long run, but uh, it might hurt the timber value. So they're trying to pick a tree that's not as valuable. As I mentioned, the stands earlier, so they're looking for tree uh, groupings of trees that are similar in uh, their type, their age, uh, and in general how they should be managed. So um, let me see, I think I have some more specific examples of that in some upcoming slides. A few other things that they're going to look for. Uh, the general health of the trees, if there's something going on, whether there's an insect or a disease, or uh, maybe they're stressed from drought, that might help us make some decisions. What's in the understory? So we might be looking at um, the ground flora, not non-tree species. So uh, what kind of ferns or what kind of um, uh, non non-woody species are under there. And that can help us understand what is going on in that forest as well. But we're also looking at what the regeneration is. So if there's a carpet of maple under there, or if there's no regeneration from the tree's perspective, maybe that means it's time to open that stand so we can get some sun onto the ground and we can get some new trees coming up underneath uh, the, the, the mature trees. They'll be looking at the soil type as well. And they could either take a sample of that and uh, do a soil test, or uh, most of them will use really detailed books that are put out by county that tell what soil type is in. Um, it's, you know, it's essentially a plat map that has the soil types on it, so they can see what's already there. 
So I'll also be looking at topography. If you have uh, really hilly slopes, that might affect what kind of logging can be done there. Uh, if you have a south-facing slope versus a north-facing so slope, it might affect what kind of trees they suggest being there or will do best there. Um, and they're also just looking at the feasibility in general of what can happen in your forest. And from that, management recommendations um, will essentially be set up that work for what is on your property and what could be on your property. Okay, one of the tools, the other tools that I wanted to mention that uh, quite a few foresters use is called the COTAR Habitat Guide, and that actually helps the forester uh, guide his decisions on what is poss probably best for your property. So based on the soil type, based on the understory plants that I mentioned earlier, uh, they're going to be looking at um, what is probably nature's preference for what's on that property. So back years ago, it was very common to see uh, pr there was a big promotion of people planting uh, plantations. <laughs> and so a lot of times people were planting, were putting plantations in where it may not have been the best land for it. Like I mentioned before, uh, you know, if we have a sandy soil, we don't want to put white elk. Well, if we have a really rich soil, maybe we want to be putting something other than a uh, species that prefers sandy soils like jack pine. So if, if the soil and everything else is saying maybe a plantation shouldn't be here, the forester can look at this COTAR's habitat guide and help determine to see what might be there. Or if, if you cut all of those pine trees down, what's going to naturally grow up behind that, that, that pine stand. And in this example, this is uh, this is called the ATM site, and that's not as important to know. Um, essentially, if this is the most common site stand in Wisconsin. So likely, if you were to clear cut that plantation on, on this site, the first thing that would come up behind it would be aspen and white birch. And so those are very sun-loving types of trees. They're going to come up first, and um, they will be they'll be the pioneer species, what we call them. There's a number of different directions that the stand could go in based on whether there's a drought or based on whether something and some kind of natural disaster comes through or whether nothing happens and nature just takes its course. So you see some of these different arrows of different directions that it could go in. But if nature were to take its course, the aspen and the birch would eventually die out and this whole list of trees would come in here, the dominant type most, most common type would be sugar maple, and there'd be a component of red maple or red oak or ash or basswood or balsam fir. And if you let it go completely, what we call the climax forest is this very top square here, which is sugar maple, hemlock, and yellow birch. That said, if you d decide that you really want turkey on your property, and the oaks, the red oaks would be really good to attract those turkey, Look, there's red oak is one of those species that can occur on this property. And if you do the specific logging and you favor the oak trees, maybe this climax forest would be red oak because of the way that you managed it. So this just gives you an idea of what's possible on that property and then what, sh what would naturally occur. And then you can work on the management within that. Uh, this is, there's a whole bunch of different habitat types in the state, and if this is something that interests you, uh, just chat with your forester and they can show you in their book which habitat type you are, and then they can explain the natural um, factors that occur to get a forest to that, that path. Just a couple other things that they also will, will look for in that inventory. Uh, I mentioned this earlier, they're insects and diseases. So in Wisconsin, and particularly in the central part of the state right now, we're having problems with gypsy moth. Emerald ash borer was discovered in the southeastern uh, part of the state. We don't ha haven't had any re recorded sightings of it up here yet. That's not to say it's not here, but it's not something we're necessarily concerned about right now. Oak wilt starting to make an appearance in some pockets. So that's something that a forester will look for on your property, but also let you know if there's something in the area that they are concerned about and they want to make sure that your forest is somewhat protected. 
And then they'll also be looking at what the historic vegetation was and if your property is either prone to fire, so in a lot of pine stands those are drier stands so they're more likely prone to fire or you might be a place in the landscape and the topography where you're likely to have frost pockets so they're going to be careful about what trees are in those frost pockets uh, or other examples are uh, windstorms and ice damage. This is an ex example of a stand description and so this owner has, uh, this is stand number one for this owner's land uh, and this is mostly northern hardwoods and when they say northern hardwoods if you look down here it says sugar maple, yellow birch and other so those are the primary trees that are in this stand. There's some information on here, there's a lot of information on here and uh, uh, it's too much for me to try and explain in one session but a forester should be able to take the time to talk through these numbers with you. Uh, one thing I'll point out here, this total basal area, actually I should have mentioned this earlier, I'm going to jump back a few slides. Here we go. So if you were to take a tree and cut it off at four and a half feet, and if you were to take a whole acre of your property and cut all of those trees off at four and a half feet, we, what basal area is, is the area in that one acre that would be uh, filled with wood. So back when we were in that stand description it said 120 square feet of basal area per acre. And this number, each uh, different stand type, whether it's an aspen stand, a northern hardwood stand, a pine plantation, uh, a pure red oak stand or a pure oak stand, there's a scientific basis for these numbers, so looking again, thinking back to that competition issue where they're competing for light and, uh, and nutrients and water, there's a certain basal area that's optimal for growing. So in this case for northern hardwoods, that optimal basal area right here is between 90 and 120 square feet uh, per acre. Once it gets above 120 square feet per acre, those trees are starting to be overcrowded and that's when they might recommend a thinning so that those trees, the rest of the remaining trees can grow better and bigger and faster. Um, some other things in here, if you just look, stand condition, it says no evidence of recent defoliation, so maybe there was a concern of gypsy moth here and they're just saying that nothing recently had happened there. One other thing I want to point out on here, um, they're saying the maple red regeneration is good but uh, buckthorn is present and I haven't mentioned invasive plants at this point, that's something that we're concerned about in Wisconsin and buckthorn is one of those species that we're keeping an eye on. Uh, the situation is such here that they're saying that if the stand is disturbed, if it's logged, the buckthorn could potentially take over. So in this case what they might say is rather than taking the forest back to 80 or 90 square feet per acre, maybe they'll do it to 100 to 120 so that they're not letting so much sunlight in that that buckthorn takes over and that maple is essentially killed out by the buckthorn. So something to be aware of, foresters are looking for invasive species and they will let you know if they're on, their pro if they're on your property. Here's an example of a, a person's property, a map of their property. Um, the cloud looking outline here is this edge of the woods and this gray line right in here is the owner's property boundary. So they own everything from the road to the gray line. And the forested parts of that have been divided into six stands and they can vary, so if you see number three says Virginia Pine, this is obviously not from Wisconsin. Uh, so number three, which is right here, this is a stand of pine, stand one, yellow poplar at 50 years, but they could be the same species. So here five and six, five and six are both ash, red oak, and yellow poplar, but one is 12 years and the other is 50 years. Those are going to have very different management activities associated with them because of the age difference. So they not only separate the species, but they also separate by age. All right, a few more things that are in the inventory. I told you, MFL plans are chock full of information. 
the most detailed management plans you'll see. So there are a few more things that they include in those management plans. Uh, endangered or threatened resources. They, uh, the foresters have access to a database that says whether there are endangered or threatened species either on the property or near the property and also cultural and archaeological resources in this area, uh, in dealing burial mounds or um, different seasonal residences. They're all cultural, uh, part of our cultural heritage. So just because that's, those things might be spotted on or near your property does not necessarily mean that you're not going to be allowed to log or do any other activities on that property. Uh, for example, if you were, if it was found that um, you had a certain type of turtle on your property, an endangered or threatened turtle, they might just say, okay, this turtle has hatching its eggs in this time of the year, so we're going to log in the winter so that we aren't disturbing the eggs. Uh, another example, a big one around here is eagle nests. So if you have probably a very large white pine with an eagle nest on it, they're either going to, well, they, they can't touch the, the nest tree, but they can log around it. And they also need to keep um, away, they can't log in that area while the um, eggs are hatching. So that just means that they would have to schedule a timber harvest uh, not during that time. So it's, we're not trying to restrict you from doing anything. It just might limit when and how you can do it. Um, if you have trails on your property or if you're interested in trails on your property, that's a good time to inventory what's out there and see what you might want to pass if there's a really interesting spring or you really have a favorite tree that maybe the forester can take that into consideration in planning for trails. And one other point that I wanted to add was about water resources. So if you have a navigable stream uh, or creek uh, in through, that runs through your property, they will include uh, what are called water quality, best management practices for water quality, or the acronym for that is BMPs. Um, in Wisconsin, we have these, the best management practices for water quality. They are voluntary. However, if you're enrolled in the Managed Forest Law Program and on all state lands, those are mandatory. So you may see some of those included in there. So if you have a stream, uh, you're limited to how much logging can occur within, I believe it's the first 500 and the first 100 feet of that stream. If there's uh, logging that needs to happen and they need to cross the stream, it's very, it's laid out how they can build a bridge and what kind of bridge needs to be laid out so that they're not affecting the stream quality in any way. So once they've done all of this inventorying and, and calculated what's on your property and drawn out some maps, you'll get a list of management activities. And those will be specific to a timeline. So they'll say in 2012 you should do a thinning of this stand. In 2025 you should do a clear cut on this part of your property. Uh, so very specific timeline. Uh, the activities can re be related to timber harvesting, they can be related to planting, they can be related to your recreation activities. Uh, one thing that is really nice about doing a timber harvest is that they actually often have to do logging roads into your property and you can define in the timber contract that you sign with the logger that you want certain logs or certain logging roads uh, to be maintained for trails once they're completed with the logging job. So you can ask, you can request that they lay down clover on that um, on that trail so that it can stay as a as a uh, so it can stay as a trail. Or you might ask that they clear up the brush along a certain area so that that is a cleaner trail for you. So to tie those two activities together is a great uh, opportunity. A forester might also help you determine the location of a food plot if that's what you're interested in, or the best location for a deer stand. Management plans cover anywhere from 10 to 50 years. 10 years is a pretty short management plan. In the grand scheme of a forest and in the life of a tree, 10 years is virtually nothing. So a, a management plan of 10 years may not necessarily have to do as much with timber harvesting as, as those extra goals of years of hunting and recreation and, and aesthetics and so on. Um, most likely a forest management plan is anywhere between 25 to 50 years. So a few things I want to finish up here. I have a few slides that are some examples of what you might see in a management plan for some specific stands. And again, these uh, there is a website on the bottom, but I'm, I believe that some of my 
presentation is cut off on the bottom, so you may not be able to see that website. But these examples that I have here are directly from that uh, the woodlandinfo.org under the uh, management planning that I pointed out earlier. And then I'll end with a few slides from the timber harvest, uh, the tour. So here are some examples. In this situation here, we have uh, 24 acres and it is mixed hardwoods and it says the DBH is, again, the diameter at breast height is between 5 and 11 inches. Uh, it's just shy of saw timber, so not real, we're not talking a real old stand. The landowner has said that they are interested in long-lived healthy trees for timber and that they want, to, that they have a trail that they're interested in, in keeping pretty. So. The forester here said that they, he or she recommended to thin it in two years and again in 14 years. And the, one additional thing, again going back to that trail where the people had a trail through their property, uh, a couple things that would be probably written into that timber contract as well is either um, we want, don't want you to log within 50 feet of this specific trail or uh, when you log within this trail, either clear out all the brush so that we're not seeing the brush at the, um, along the trail, or <laughs> the other side of that is put all the brush piles along the trail so we're attracting the wildlife and we'll see some wildlife when we're out on our hiking, when we're out hiking. So these are some of the things that can be written into in addition to just a general uh, management prescription for those trees. Another uh, example, going to that pine plantation we talked about. So here's a 10-acre red pine plantation, 24 years, uh, fairly young at this point. Though the, the owners are interested in saw logs, so they want large diameter trees to sell, but they also want it. They want to visually enjoy the property. So the timber prescription for it is to, says to thin immediately, and again in 10, and again in 20 years. Uh, it's not uncommon to regularly go into a plantation like that and thin it out. Uh, when they, a, a normal thinning for a plantation is going in and probably taking every other row of trees, but because this owner said that they wanted a little bit better visual picture, they didn't want the straight plantation view, uh, they might go through and selectively thin the plantation. So they'll look for the trees that have the best growth potential for those saw logs that they're interested in and then thin the trees around it to allow that one specific tree some more growing space. And that way, rather than keeping the visual look of the rows, they're actually starting to mix it up a little bit so it looks like a little bit more of a natural forest. How am I doing on time? Okay, we've got a few minutes. Uh, I'm going to skip this one because I, I wanted to talk about Aspen for a minute. Uh, I know people are a little afraid of the, the clear-cut concept, but uh, here we have a 55-year-old Aspen stand, so it's getting a little bit up in age. Um, Aspen, the only way to regenerate Aspen is to clear-cut it. It uh, grows from root sprouts, so um, these, all of these aspen that you see in this picture are connected by their roots and once they're harvested, it's a sun-loving species so they need a lot of sun and as soon as you cut down all those trees, it signals something to the hormones in the trees and they send out a whole bunch of shoots. So if you've ever seen a, an aspen clear cut and then you go back a year later or two years later, it's just absolutely thick with aspen. That's the way you have to, to regenerate aspen. So. Here, the landowner said we want to harvest at economic maturity, but they also want habitat for deer and grouse. So the forester, before they saw that deer and grouse objective, might have said, let's just go in and clear cut the entire stand now or go ahead and clear cut it in 10 years. Instead, what they're trying to do, and if those of you that were here when we had the uh, the session on wildlife with Jamie Knack, she mentioned the various habitat needs for uh, species. So one type of stand provides uh, maybe nesting sites, another type of stand uh, provides cover so that they can hide from predators, another type of stand might provide the food that they need. So here they're trying to provide two different habitat covers, so they're going to clear cut half of it now and then the other half in 10 years, so you're providing two different uh, habitat requirement needs for the grouse and the deer. 
we've got a, a hay, an open hay field here. A forester can help you with that as well, and it doesn't necessarily need to include all trees on it. Uh, looking at wildlife habitat here, but they also want some trees for the next generation. So they can, they may not have specific ideas for wildflowers, but they can work with the wildlife folks to see what kind of wildflowers would be best. And uh, they're going to keep some places uh, mowed, so there's some trails, and they're also going to, they'll also be able to suggest some evergreen trees to plant, plant on there for the interests of the future generations. And you might be interested in, in leaving some, uh, planting some wildlife crops, some food crops, or keeping some space open just for those uh, wildlife to, to come to. All right. Uh, as I mentioned, I've got some pictures from a, what we're calling the timber tour. Uh, a, one of our colleagues followed a timber harvest for two to, two to three years and took pictures of the stand before the harvest, right after the harvest, and then a few years down the road from the harvest. And so I just wanted to share these pictures with you. Uh, I, I will say that there are some ugly timber harvests, and then there are some bad, ugly timber harvests. <laughs> um, I don't know that a timber harvest necessarily looks aesthetically pleasing always immediately after. So I just wanted to share with you, it might be a little bit shocking at first, but Anyway, in this picture, the landowner for this specific stand was interested in, in recreation. And if you see, here's the deer stand in this tree here, in these trees. Uh, so they're interested in attracting some wildlife to their property for the express purpose of hunting. So here's before, before the harvest, and here is six months after the harvest. You can see the tree stand still there. And it doesn't look like much. However, uh, if you remember, again, to Jamie's presentation about creating um, piles, brush piles for the wildlife. They've done that in this picture. So you can see a brush pile here, and you can see a brush pile here, and that's attracting a very specific type of wildlife. There's a pine left here, and possibly they did that because they're trying to, uh, there's another pine over here, uh, encourage those, those species, so they left those. But two years later, uh, you're getting quite a bit of green. That the, uh, <laughs> the deer stand didn't quite make it for the, the hunting but uh, you do see some gener regeneration coming up, and you see some green. The next, uh, I believe this is all one landowner's property. So here they were looking at creating some edge, and um, going back again to Jamie's presentation about some uh, being able to attract species that are, have a preference to edge. So there are interior forest species, and there are edge forest species. So uh, again, they cut a bunch of this area right here. This picture was taken in the fall, so it's a little hard to see. But it, there's a stand of trees still up here. And these trees, they, they're all still alive. <laughs> so there's a band of trees along here. And then the forest continues on the other side. So this might be just like a little wildlife opening where you, you're creating a little bit of edge. And two years after, this is a better picture in the spring, so you can see that forest stand around it. But there's uh, plenty of, of green to attract the wildlife. And of course, there's still some brush piles in here around the edges. And the last is a scenic view picture. So here we have uh, the stand before and six months after. And I'm going to go back for a sec. You didn't even know that that vista was in the, it was in the background of that picture. And maybe behind, this, behind the camera is uh, someone's house. And they were hoping to get a, a view of the, of the surrounding uh, hills. So they cut. And there it is two and a half years later. And you can see there's actually some really nice oak regeneration here. When they opened it up, some of those oak really love the sunlight and will, will thrive when you open it up like that. So that's two and a half years later. And with that, I know that all of you have my uh, email address, but there it is just in case. Uh, one last thing that I wanted to mention is, again, this was based on a managed forest law plan, but there is a whole array of uh, management plans. And one of the things that's in between there is called a stewardship plan. And a DNR forester can actually write a stewardship plan for you for free. You might have to wait a little bit to get that and get in line for it, but they can write a stewardship plan for free. It will not qualify you for the managed forest law program. 
um, but it's it's usually a MF fell plan light, I guess is a way to put it. So there's an opportunity to do that. Also, as a reminder, the Wiffle Gap program, the Wisconsin Forest Landowner Grant program that we talked about in that first session, uh, can be used. You can apply for that to get a 50% cost share to get a management plan written for your property. And of course, you can always do something in your head as long as as long as you've thought it out. So uh, I did want to mention real quick, Bill, I hear you getting on, but I forgot to mention at the very beginning that the next session is the timber harvesting. I know we've been teasing you guys since week one uh, with everybody telling you that the timber harvesting session is next, but I promise you it is actually next. And uh, the final session will be... Uh, uh, based on all of everybody, uh, based on the voting in the first two sessions, will be insects and diseases. So, with that, Bill, I hear you on. Do you have some questions for me and some poll questions? I do, and uh, thanks for reminding me. Uh, let's uh, while I uh, pose some of the questions that have you, you guys have submitted, I'm going to ask you to fill out some of our polls that we have again. And here's the first question, Chris. It follows what you were saying in regards to Wiffle Gap. How much? The question is, how much might it cost to have a plan developed by a forester? Um, you know, it's really hard for me to say, but some for a 40-acre parcel, uh, the estimates are somewhere between $500 and $800. So with that Wiffle Gap funding, it would be between $250 to $400. Okay. Just a few more folks need fill out the poll and then we'll go to the next question. The next, uh, here's, here's your next question to you, Chris. Uh, why is DBH, DBH diamond or breast type measured at four and a half feet? Why not lower? Um, if I, well, let's see if I can find that slide. Oh, I'm running okay. out of the poll. <laughs> there we go. Oh. Did you find it? Was it? Yes. <laughs> okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I did I come over something? Nope. I'm running doing another poll. So. Okay. Okay. When it, when it's finished, I'll let you post it up again. Just a few more seconds. Sorry. That, yeah. Nope. Sorry. That's fine. Five, four, three, two, one. <laughs> oh. Okay, there you go, Chris. <laughs> All right. So uh, this, I, I, this, the picture on the far left here, it's a little bit exaggerated, but generally what we, there's a little what we call butt swell on a tree. So the bottom part of a tree tends to jut out a bit more. And what they're looking for is a straight, clear log. So they're trying to get the DBH of the first log, and that generally occurs at four and a half feet from the ground. They they can cut a little bit lower than that, but that's what the what the true average of that's going to be. Okay, I got another question for you, Chris. The uh, wait a second. The um, in developing a plan, do you need to have a plan for a timber harvest? I got another poll for folks to fill out. Go ahead, okay. Chris. Um, nothing says that you are required to have a management plan to have a timber harvest for your property. But going back to that one of those beginning slides talking about mismanagement, that's where we see the most mismanagement happening, is that there's not a, a clear understanding on the part of the logger of what needs to happen on that property, what the landowner wants to happen on that property. So that logger is probably going to go in and select trees that he thinks are best on the market and may not necessarily fulfill your needs for wildlife or recreation or so on and so forth. So. Um, I, as much as you do not, need, there's no law and no requirement saying you must have a management plan, but uh, it's to your greatest interest to actually have a management plan. And I think Tom Steele, who's going to be doing our presentation on timber harvesting next week, if you're going to be on that presentation, uh, what he's going to tell you will probably even more encourage you to have a management plan for your property beforehand. And here's another question uh, you did in regards to Wiffle Gap. Uh, do you apply for the, when do you apply for the grant, before or after MFL? Um, you, you would apply for before you apply for MFL. Uh, the, only part, the only thing that's a kind of a problem is that it's going to delay your entry into MFL to, because you have to, 
you can't apply for cost sharing on something that you're currently in the process of doing. So if you have a, hire, a forester hired now, you can't apply for WIFLGAP funding. You have to get that funding and then hire a forester to do your management plan. So yeah, it can't be activities that are in process. Okay, I'm going to close this poll. I got a technical question for you, Chris. You ready for this? Can I have a can I have a forest of mixed hardwood and aspen in the same stand? Should I clear cut all the aspen? Um, you're you're not likely to have a lot of aspen. <laughs> you're 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 definitely not going to have a majority of aspen. Uh, with some mature hardwoods in there because what will happen is eventually the aspen trees get shaded out and the other trees are over competing them and the aspen trees will will die out um, so if you want to regenerate purely aspen clear cutting is the best way to do it I'm, I'm, Bill, I don't <laughs> do you want to add anything to that I think, and the only thing I would add is that it, it really depends on what your priority is for managing for your stand. If you want to get Aspen back, then by all means do that, then, then do a, a clear cut. Or It really depends on what your stand is, and that's something that's a good question to, to work with, a forester that you might talk with. It's, it's hard for us to answer a, a broad question like that without, you know, in, in a brief span of time we have here. So, yeah. Okay. I, the only <laughs> thing ahead. that I'll add is that, uh, well, two things. I guess one is that aspen in general is something that's disappearing in Wisconsin's landscape. And so a lot of foresters will probably encourage you to keep the aspen component. Uh, that said, if you have aspen and you really don't want aspen, there are ways of uh, cutting in a forest. Uh, what they'll do is essentially um, maintain a certain percentage of shade in the understory so that aspen don't thrive and other species can come up underneath that. Um, so that's the only thing I would add. Okay. Is there a website that posts daily prices on timber? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in general, um, you might want to ask Tom Steele that question in the next presentation, but mills tend to be pretty tight-lipped about what they're offering for wood or what they're buying wood for. So no, they don't generally go out and advertise what they're buying wood for each day. Um, but there might be a site somewhere that gives you an average. Uh, that stuff's really hard to find, but I think Tom might have a better in on that than I do. And there's a couple more questions. We're getting close to the time we should be finishing up. There's a couple more questions that are specific, like uh, um, should I cut elm to get rid of or get rid, clean out elm, and uh, you know which trees should I harvest on my property? These are good questions. We'll uh, we don't really have time to address them here, and and this, these are also good kind of questions to, to save for Tom Steele next week. He can he's a good one to ask, and it fits well with what the things he's going to talk about in his session. I think if if uh, if Chris you ready, I think it's this might be a good time to end this uh, this uh, session. We're trying to keep it to about an hour in time so that uh, we can actually record it and put it onto our website. If it gets too long, it it's too difficult to uh, put on our website. So um, thank you, so, thanks everyone for attending. We will um, we'll see you next week, same time, same place, and we'll be talking a little bit about introduction timber harvesting and sales. Having a have a good evening, everyone.